I want to welcome officially Fred Wilson into our Central Synagogue community. And uh, as part of that welcome, I'd love to share with all of you who Fred is. Fred is one of the most renowned artists living and working today. He's known for his uh, interdisciplinary practice that challenges assumptions about history, culture, race, and display. By reframing objects and cultural symbols, he encourages viewers to reconsider social and historical narratives. He did this in his early works, which used museums' own collections to excavate marginalized histories. And he's continued in more recent years in his works in glass, which include ambiguous black colored forms that uh, assert challenging political and racial undercurrents. In 2003, Fred Wilson represented the United States at the Venice Biennale. Um, for those who are not art world insiders, the Venice Biennale is like the Olympics or the Super Bowl, or in our language, like the high holidays of the art world. For much of the work for that show, Fred developed um, it in reaction to his observation that numerous Venetian history paintings included black figures um, though he couldn't identify them or couldn't find them in written histories. Today, Fred's body of work encompasses sculpture and painting, photography and collage, printmaking and installation. He is internationally lauded for his conceptual practice um, and it subverts perception, revealing the undercurrents of historical discourse, of ownership and of privilege that are all normalized by institutional practices. Tonight, he's going to use his art to help us take a look at what needs to be revealed and reassessed in our world, in our institutions, and maybe even in our own lives. You are all lovingly muted, and we have disabled just so gently the uh, chat function so that we can all focus on the presentation. But keep in mind any questions you'd like to ask, we will um, re-enable the chat function at the end of the presentation so that we can uh, share those questions at the very end. Now, Fred, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be showing a, a bunch of different projects and uh, images and um, as I, you know, I've, I've done the projects with, inst with institutions over like, I don't remember, 42 in institutions in recent, in over the years. And, uh, uh, and, but I've only chosen a few tidbits from like, or maybe the greatest hits of some of the projects I've, I've worked on that I think, uh, reveal, you know, how I do things and why I do them uh, in just looking at talking about this, the images. So I guess we should probably start. Let's start with the first image. Oh, great. Well, uh, this is an early early sculpture uh, I I did when I before my uh, museum practice took 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 hold. But these were all my art history tomes. Uh, I guess I maybe I felt like that. Uh, uh, here, Atlas holding up the tomes, and uh, but also um, very little was uh, known when I was in college about African art, and certainly not African American artists. So here you have the great masters uh, weighing down Atlas with uh, African art underfoot, or maybe uh, the basis for a lot of, uh, of the nations or the world's history. Uh, next image. But I'm a New Yorker. I, I was born here, raised here, and uh, was, you know, my mother was an artist and school teacher, and uh, she always took me to all the museums. And I took class. I went to Music and Art High School years ago. Like so many, so many people I know now, uh, and uh, would come to the Met quite often. Uh, and then also, I I, I took uh, some classes at the Museum of Natural History. But uh, what, after college, I worked at the Metropolitan uh, in the education department, uh, mostly as a freelance um, educator. And similarly, at the Museum of Natural History, I was also a freelance educator. 
And what fascinated me was that uh, both of them had similar structures uh, built in a particular, a similar time period, um, but also displayed, if you look at Africa, Asia, Latin, and uh, Latin America, uh, had very similar uh, objects or cultures within their institutions, but how they displayed them, talked about them, was completely different as if they maybe, you know, if you didn't, if you couldn't just visually see the uh, relationship, it was like they're two different, uh, two different objects, even though they would perhaps be the same similar type of objects, but just looked at from a very different vantage point in each institution. And uh, I found that really fascinating and I enjoyed the fact that, or it was very observed that how people acted in those institutions, even though they were right across the street from each other, was very different one to the other. Uh, one would be, um, uh, you know, uh, lots of people walking around in hushed tones, and the other would be very frenetic with kids and everyone uh, speaking uh, in a very, you know, in a very different manner. And uh, I, I found that fascinating how the institutions showing s similar cultures uh, and but speaking about them extremely differently, as if the other, uh, as if the other institution did have a totally different kind of work objects. Uh, and then how people interacted there was different as well. Um, and all that for me kind of came to I really start thinking about this because I was uh, I worked in the institutions. I was a visitor to the institutions. I was an, I'm an artist, which is because I, so it means I have another perspective that I bring to bear uh, in these, both these environments. Uh, next slide. Uh, well, I also, as I said, I worked in institutions, but when I was in college, I, I worked as a museum guard in, a, in the college museum, it was the Newberger Museum uh, at Purchase College. And it was, for me, another interesting experience that, that uh, I remember very well. Um, you know, you're, you're standing there, uh, people walk right by you, they basically, you're, you're part of the, you know, the walls, or at least back then. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's like you were, you were there, but you weren't there. You were invisible to the public, even though everything else was highly, you know, the, the, the non-living things were completely observed and understood and seen. And that's really always stuck with me, uh, uh, the invisibility of the guards, and they have a very important function in institutions. Uh, things have changed a lot since this, this artwork, which is called Guarded View. Um, and they're headless because really we were interchangeable uh, in, in the institution. As I said, now it's kind of quite different. However, when I did come to, when I, when I moved back to New York and was working in, in education in both these museums, I, I knew a lot of educators and, um, the, at one point before I, before this, this work was ever seen or known about and, and you know, or I even made it, uh, I was, I was invited by the Whitney Museum to give a, a tour. They were having artists give talks around exhibitions in the museum. And so I said, sure, I'll do this. And I said, I'll do it if I can be in costume. Uh, and I say, what kind of costume? But they were, everybody said, well, that's a great idea that you, you know, you're an artist, you can do whatever, you know, do whatever you want with this. And so I had lunch uh, in the, their, you know, you know, their, their uh, conference room uh, with, with the educators, the, uh, the, the um, uh, all the docents. And then, and some, some of the, I, I knew because they were, I worked in education, they worked in education. And so we sort of knew each other. Uh, and I said, well, okay, this has been, Great lunch. I'm going to go and change to my costume now and meet you at the sign that says Fred Wilson speaks at two, two o'clock. So I um, left them. They were all excited to see what this was going to be. I don't know if they thought I was going to be in a bunny costume or what. But anyway, I uh, changed. I knew guards everywhere. And I so I changed into a guard's uniform and stood by my sign. And everyone came down from the conference room. Uh, to where I was standing and milled around in front of me, waiting for me to show up. 
uh, not noticing that who I was there, that I just had lunch with them. And uh, so I finally said, well, all right, let's get this, this uh, tour started. And of course, they were all startled and the friends I, who I'd known, uh, a little embarrassed because obviously we knew each other and they didn't see me there. But you put on the, the guard's uniform and you disappear. And if it hadn't happened, I would have been shocked. But it did, which, uh, which was the first part of the first thing that I wanted them to see uh, in this uh, in this tour. And I, I I walked around talking about the exhibition. I won't go into details about the uh, issues that I that I saw within the within the exhibition. Uh, but um, it was a great experience. The guards, all the guards, came off the one came off the station to see what I was doing, and something like they say. I always want to say that about that artwork and. Um, and then the public saw this guard talking in art historical terms about the artwork, and it was uh, kind of a great, a great uh, experience to uh, to do that within the institution. Um, I always I stayed, you know, I was in the the, uh, the uh, exhibition there, uh, the Whitney Biennial years ago, and uh, eventually when I put after I premiered this this artwork at my gallery uh, and then uh, eventually as a long story eventually went to different uh, collections uh, and then eventually it came to uh, on the market and the Whitney bought it and, and it's still there it's a wonderful uh, the guards of course many of them are that I knew from back then are still still there and they they love it when it comes out when, when, the first time I was on view uh, one of the guards and it was right in front of the elevator. One of the guards stood there, and when people got out the elevator, he moved, and everyone jumped. But because <laughs> uh, he was the live guard, uh, anyway. Next image. Um, and you know, I've so I, you know I've been in, in and out of museums for you know and interested in museums for a long time, and you know I felt uncomfortable in museums sometimes, and and it's a couple other times, and I. I was invited because I was working making fake uh, or you know fake environments uh, that look like museums in gallery spaces and nonprofit environments. Uh, two people who had a had a uh, organization in Baltimore in 1991. They asked me to uh, see find a, a museum someplace in Maryland or in Baltimore. Excuse me. And they would try to see if they could talk them into uh, having me do a project there with their collection. Now, I never, you know, I would have always thought to, would love to work with a collection and, and, and make an exhibition, but, but uh, this museum called the Contemporary uh, made this happen. So I talked to all the different directors. I, they, I'm not quite sure they understood why I was there talking to them, but anyway, uh, I, uh, I chose this museum out of all of them. This is the Maryland Historical Society. And I chose it because, and this is a room uh, in the Historical Society as I, as I found it. I, I chose this because I felt, you know, I, I, it's all these beautiful uh, paintings and, and decorative art, uh, and I felt really uncomfortable there. And I wanted to know why I felt uncomfortable there. I wanted to sort of understand why. And, and uh, so I thought, well, this is where I need to do my project. Uh, and surprisingly, the director said yes. Uh, next image. So I had the entire third floor of the of the museum to do my project. And basically, all I did was talk to people and look at things. That was the entire the entire project. I talked to the chairman of the board. I, I talked to. Uh, the lady who cleaned the silver, you know, the, the maintenance people, the registrars, the, the gift store people, and everyone in between. Uh, and of course, I had many, well, actually, I didn't have many conversations with the director at that time, uh, but uh, he and the rest of the staff uh, were well aware and were, you know, uh, the director really spearheaded this and allowed their, all their staff to interact with me and help me uh, um, make this project happen. Uh, so in the storage rooms, I found, since it's a historical society, they have, they have interesting 
odd things. I found this uh, globe with the word truth emblazoned across it in, in their silver storage. And uh, this was the first object you saw as you, as you uh, went, to, went into my, my exhibition. Uh, and I thought that what a great way to, to start my exhibition. Uh, whose truth in history, whose truth in, in museums, and you know, uh, who decides what, truth, what is truth? And so my name, nothing else was there, just, just this, and it had uh, a label saying, Globe made, to, made whatever the year was. Uh, and uh, for, uh, it was actually a Globe for Truth in Advertising. And I don't know when the notion of truth and advertising ended, but then it came to the museum and, and went into storage. Um, so and in addition, I had this label that said plastic mounts, uh, maker unknown, because I wanted to, to emphasize that everything in the institution, you know, not, not only the collection, but everything around you, there has a story to it and a reason for being and, and, and being there. And so you had to really look at everything a little more closely than you might in, in a regular exhibition. Um, but I, uh, the directors was uh, kind of wanted to know what the title of the exhibition was going to be. And uh, I was just looking at things. So, um, you know, I, I uh, and of course, they wanted to start promoting the exhibition even before I, before I knew what the thing was. Uh, so I decided to call it Mining the Museum which basically is what I was doing. I was digging through their collections, which they had deep, deep uh, collections of things. And I was perhaps going to, you know, blow up things uh, about uh, the, the notions of museums have, and certainly historical sites have about their, their objects. But mostly I wanted to make it mine. So mining the museum relates to all those, those uh, meetings. Next slide. So here was the first thing you saw up the, off the stairs or up the, in the elevator, where it was this display. Uh, you have on the right, uh, you have three busts of uh, famous men. Uh, I put, and uh, I put that in, in quotations. Uh, on, the, on the far uh, left, uh, uh, the first bust is Henry Clay. The far right, is Andrew Jackson. Uh, one of my favorite men in the history. Uh, and in the center is Napoleon. Now, this is the Maryland Historical Society. I am not sure why Napoleon is in the Maryland Historical Society, or it wasn't at the time I sort of found out his, uh, some things about his family connections to Baltimore, but he, he never made it to Baltimore. Either. But anyway, I figured I'd, I'd, put it, uh, I'd put it in the exhibition since it was there. I found it there and I put it in the exhibition. And on the other side were three empty pedestals uh, that I also found and had them sitting there. Next slide. Uh, but they were sitting there. However, I did have labels on them, no bus, but labels. And they said, Harriet Tubman, Benjamin Banneker, Frederick Douglass, all uh, famous uh, American individuals, all African-American individuals, and nothing about them in the Maryland Historical Society, all from Maryland and nothing about them in the Maryland Historical Society, I should add. So rather than, than I could have easily gotten a lot of material locally about these three individuals, but I, I really, this was really about the institution itself and how they saw history. And uh, I tried to emphasize with the curators and, and the registrars that none of them were there when this collection was, was uh, put together. Uh, so they, they can't, uh, you know, so there's no, they should not feel blame for what the collection had and, and didn't have, especially if they were there, if they were not at the museum very long. Uh, and so it's from there the journey went with them uh, as I, went through finding things within the institution. This was a rather large show, but I'm only showing you smatterings of, of it. Uh, next slide. And so I brought many paintings up from, the, uh, from different parts of the museum and, and installed them in this way. Um, the, um, the painting at the far, on the far right 
was a rip painting. I asked for a rip painting, and you know, every museum has a rip painting. They don't want to talk about it much, but there's there are things that need repair, let's put it that way. But I didn't want them to repair it. I wanted them to bring it out as just as it was. And um, the uh, the rip was over the, the, the uh, patrician's face. Uh, and so I made, I, you know, I got to know the staff very well. So I made a, a I, I was discussing with the maintenance guy and some of the guards, uh, what, you know, what they thought of this painting. And we had a great discussion. And one of them I did a uh, kind of an African-American uh, custodian. I uh, did a, 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 a video of him and his face is in the rip. It's very bright because it was, you know, uh, uh, the video behind the painting. So his face came uh, behind the painting, behind the rip, where you saw one eye was the African-American uh, you know, maintenance man and the eye of the, the uh, man in the painting. And I also had voices coming from that painting, which said, uh, where is my mama? Things like that. Uh, again, sort of highlighting perhaps someone's hidden history uh, of be not exactly maybe being a very light complexion and sort of melding into uh, the white society when actually they came from the black community. And so uh, it's a story that that uh, we're passing for white, as one might say, uh, that used to be said. And, you know, so sort of trying to re rethinking who this man could or, or would have been or might have been. Uh, next image. And here was this uh, another painting. I found several of these paintings. Uh, this is a, a painting of one, two, three, four, five uh, children who were the children of the, the person who commissioned the painting. But then if you look closely, there are two other children. Next image. In the periphery. And you only saw them, and the painting had layer, you know, was, was old, so it was layered with, uh, you know, uh, whatever, whatever it makes paintings darken. Um, and um, so you really couldn't, it was hard to see those, the black children in the painting. However, I saw them uh, and I saw the black children in many paintings. The whole exhibition was full of, my exhibition was full of these, these black children in the margins. Uh, and so not just to leave it, uh, you know, it's a dark painting. I had uh, them add specific lights. This is completely lit up, but uh, I had them, as you step in front of the painting, the painting would light up so that you could see these other children. And I, I worked with the education staff uh, when they came to see the exhibition um, to and took classes. Children, roughly around the age of the children in the painting, at, and they were African-American children, asking it, and asked them what they thought these black children were thinking or saying. And uh, so I used the audio tapes uh, of that to also speak to the viewer. They said things like, who calms me when I'm afraid? Who washes my back? Where is my mother? These are all things that the children said about what they thought they might be, the, ch the children in the painting might be saying. And so each painting, uh, it would the black child would be illuminated, and voices black of black children would would ask these questions, which they thought that the children in the center of the painting, uh, on the periphery of the painting, might think might be saying. Uh, next image, uh, and um, here we have uh, another painting. This painting was right by the front door, and uh, the director of the painting. The director of the museum said, you know, I never noticed that black child in the painting, you know, after, <laughs> after he saw what I was doing. And, you know, it's kind of a stretch because he's very clearly there in the painting, but you weren't meant to see the black children in the painting. And, you know, there are many other things in that, in that regard where you were not there to see the African-American uh, content or history within this institution, even though they were there in front of your face. Um, you were there to sort of step into history, step into the what you already thought about history, 
and become a part of the upper echelons of society, not the black, not you know, average, even average Marylanders uh, depict were depicted in these in this institution, and certainly not the black uh, community. And when we moved the painting, we realized that the black child had a metal collar around his neck. Uh, and of course, the director walked by this painting every day. Um, so the voice on this painting said, am I your friend? Am I your brother? Am I your pet? And in the history and horrors of slavery, he could have been all three. The black child has, uh, the white child has the bow and arrow, the black child has the bird. He was sort of like the golden retriever for the white child. Next slide. Uh, let me go back. Oh, well, no, no, I'll just continue. Um, so I, there are many paintings that, you know, large and small, and this one was called Country Life. It was by an artist named Ernest Fisher. It was painted in 1850. Uh, now, in 1850, it was not the fashion to name a painting, name your artwork, for the artist's name and artwork. So somewhere along the lines over history, it was named Country Life by the, the collector or the, the donor to, to the museum of the painting or the, the curator or you know, the registrar, someone named it Country Life. It was not going to be the, the artist who made the painting. So I figured, well, if it wasn't the artist naming the painting, I can name it too. So I put my own label on the other side another title for this painting. Next slide. And I called it Frederick Serving Fruit. Now, this could have been Frederick Douglass uh, in this painting, depicting this painting. And of course, my name is Frederick. So uh, it's, it's really amazing how just a slight phrase can shift the attention, the meaning, the focus of an artwork. Next slide. Now, this museum was, uh, was uh, organized as some historic societies are or maybe were in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 1992 when I did the project. Um, by their, by the, the material, not, it's not, not, even though this is art and history museum, it didn't, uh, it wasn't, uh, only about art, so the material is very important. And this is Baltimore Reposé Silver, uh, and which they were very proud of, and it is extremely beautiful. I learned about that a lot. And then, so they would not say much besides the date, and that's what I did, uh, calling it Metalwork 1793 to 1880. Uh, oh, next slide. However, I also found in the ledger books uh, this, uh, slave shackles, also made of metal, and certainly made at the same, at the same time as these other objects. And to me, you know, they, they said, you would, no museum back then, or certainly not historical society, would, would do this, put, put uh, these things together. However, they're both made of metal. They're both from the same period. And uh, whose hand had to serve the silver? Who, who's, uh, you know, could have made those silver objects at the end of slavery in apprenticeship situations. Uh, and certainly, whose labor is supported wealth that could produce the silver? And um, so I didn't say anything beyond metalwork and the dates. Uh, because, you know, our museums would, would have these, these various histories. They'd have the glory of, of our culture in one museum and the horrors in another museum, and, or, you know, are in really separate parts of the museum, never related to each other. And they both say so much about each other and so intertwined, you know, in our history. Uh, so this was quite shocking, especially for the woman who donated the silver. She, her daughter was working with me on the project. She just was just, she didn't tell me that her, her mother had donated the silver, but she said, I can't wait for my mother to see this. And I didn't know why. Well, now I know why. But at any rate, um, next slide. So that was a very large exhibition, but I'm just jumping around and, and talking about different projects. Uh, and 
So this is, uh, again, I, 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 I did work at the Seattle Art Museum. It was the next project. It wasn't historic. It wasn't a historic project. I kind of had done, I thought I was over with historic uh, museums. So I did something at the Seattle Art Museum, but I, I've sort of come back. Uh, people kept asking me to do projects in their, in their museums, uh, in their historic museums. And this one I decided to do. It's in, it's, this is in Winston-Salem, which actually one of my family lineages come from Winston and I had never been, so that was a great reason to, to do this. Uh, and this was a settlement, this was a historic village. Uh, it's uh, called Old Salem. And the, uh, the people who came here uh, were a German Czech speaking group of people and they came here for religious freedom. And, uh, and they had a, they were very separate from the rest of the Southern society. They kept within their, their, their property, but they did have a tavern uh, that, that uh, you know, outsiders could come and, and see. They're the Moravians, I think, don't want to forget. Uh, it were the Moravians that came to the United States uh, and settled for religious freedom. And they also, um, they had a tavern and, um, and some, some uh, hotel, small hotel. And yes, uh, George Washington did sleep there. So I'm told. So, and then as I was walking around, just, just looking at the uh, environment, uh, the person who's taking me around said, just out of the blue, uh, there were uh, there were black people here, but not many. Anyway, and so I, they, then he went on with his, his speech, and I decided that to, I just asked, well, really, I want to know a little bit more about this. Uh, it was not obviously a part of their usual tours, um, so we began to talk about about that, what what little he knew about the African American community there, uh, who were, you know. Uh, part of this society, this this group in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, um, and in the center of this this image is a church. It's the home Arabian church, and it's a beautiful church. And apparently, the the, the few black the black community that was you know, near, near or on or near the property uh, in, the, in the early years sat in the back of the church. But eventually, they they uh, they were moved out of out of that and they, they, they lived on the other side of, of the fence around uh, the, uh, and over a little river in the, uh, beyond the woods, uh, the African American Moravian community was there and would come to work from, from outside this, this, uh, this environment. Uh, next slide. And they didn't have many artifacts, so, uh, so they would, uh, have someone, you know, someone be churning butter and they talk about that or what have you. So I decided to also have my little, you know, uh, project where you go from house to house and see what the houses were about. And, uh, but I sort of did research on the African American community. Um, they were, um, uh, there was nothing on them except their, the memorials of when they die. And so here, this is a, what I could gather, uh, of someone named R.H. who died in childbirth. Uh, next image. And Rose who worked in a still. Next image. And then I also saw these quite fascinating to me. Uh, here, here we have a Bible. And though they were Moravians, the blacks were Moravians, they still got whipped. That is a, a leather whip. And so as you see, the label says leather bound. Uh, next image. So I was going all around the, all around the uh, environment uh, and all the, looking at all the houses and looking at all the structures and you know, really beautifully, uh, not, uh, beautifully taken care of. I wouldn't say renovated, but beautifully taken care of. And then I, I saw this building because I was looking for locations to do, a, do an installation. I, I saw this place, which seemed like, you know, nothing was happening with it. So I asked, well, what was this building? And they said, oh, well, 
that's that was the black church after they moved them out of moved them so they were not worshiping with the, the white moravians they they built this church i said oh uh well can what is this church? they said well we use it for storage so i said well since you're just using it for storage maybe i could do a project within within this building and they said well sure now, very interesting, the, the home Moravian church had these really beautiful white stones in, in front of it. I didn't have, I don't have a picture of it, but these beautiful white stones is what they're known, the Moravians are known for. The stones lay flat. They're huge stones with the names of deceased. And this was a Moravian church. And there apparently were stones, but there were no stones there, and nobody seemed to know where they were. So as I was thinking about this project, I decided, well, I'll look around. I looked behind the church. And, no stones. I looked in all the buildings and could find no stones. And so I, I kind of didn't give up, but I just felt, well, let me go on and, and work on this a little bit more. But uh, next slide. So in lieu of the stones, I, I made uh, um, these silhouettes of various, uh, of various people in the black community, which was, which was to the right of this, this structure over a stream beyond the woods. And I guess they came to this structure uh, that way. So I, I, I so there's surrogates for the people who are buried there. So I went about my business doing all the, uh, uh, the rest of the whole project. Uh, but I, I still was intrigued by this church. And so I looked in the church and, you know, didn't find anything. And uh, besides the uh, move, we moved their storage out uh, and, and the pews were put replaced for, for my project. Uh, and then, um, I don't know, something said, well, why don't we look under the church? Uh, next slide. And there they were. Some of them holding up the joists of the church uh, and, and obviously lots thrown under the church. Uh, here they were, Rose, R.H., who worked in a still, uh, Timothy, is, who was my, said something about from Africa and played the fiddle. And all these stones were the stones of the people that I had researched. Uh, and so you heard of their memorials, and, and, and before you went into the church, I, I opened the doors and, and had put a plastic, uh, you know, plexi um, uh, screen over the, over the floor so you could walk in over and go all the way into the church, uh, walk and not disturb these, these uh, stones, but and just, just lit them so you could see them. And these were the names of the people that you had heard about when you went on the rest of the tour, but you didn't know you were going to see anything about, else about them. And, and here, is, here they are uh, thrown under the church. And no one can explain to me why that was done. Uh, but anyway, that's how I found it. I, I had uh, audio tapes within the back of the church uh, in the, in the uh, uh, not the back of the church, but in the pews, there was a voice of an elderly woman, African American woman, a child, and they, and they would say, were they happy here? Were they safe here? And the, and the, uh, the child asked the uh, elderly woman, and the elderly woman said, I don't remember, I don't remember. Um, there was more, uh, there was much more to, to sort of experience or to see, but there was more uh, 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 talks and dialogues that happened with uh, from voices coming from the building. Uh, this was, this was quite a find and people were embarrassed, but also, you know, excited to find it. And the entire city council came to see this exhibition, the whole exhibition, because, you know, this was a historic village that had been renovated. Uh, and this was something that never had been touched. And so that I can talk about what happened with, with the church since then, but uh, I'll move on. Next slide. So I had done many projects in various places uh, and um, I was invited to, to uh, Pilchuck, a glass school outside of Seattle, founded by Dale Chihuly. Uh, and so I went not working, I don't have a particular medium, material, so I thought, well, why not glass? I'll try using glass. And so I, I experimented with these glass, uh, with 
glass objects create. Having glass blowers, uh, I learned how to blow glass, but I could never be proficient in it. I don't do it every day. And uh, had them, I found, found, came to this form, this drip form. And, uh, and then the, the early ones had, I put these eyes on them and I realized that this was some very deep issue for me. Uh, it reminded me of, you know, some of the cartoons, recycled cartoons from the thirties of black people be either becoming or coming out of, you know, inanimate materials such as ink, tar, oil. And, uh, and here, here it was just something that bubbled up within me to do. Uh, and so I did a number of them, uh, this way, but then eventually I sort of got rid of the, um, the, the eyes. I felt that I had done, I had purged myself of that and sort of wanted to move on from, from that, that association and that memory. Next image. That's called drip drop plop. Anyway, so I've made many, many such drip forms and I think maybe I have a couple of images. Uh, this is not the United States. This is a sort of Jeffersonian looking building, but it is the American Pavilion in Venice and where I was the, uh, uh, the artist creating the, my project, a project there in Venice. And it was so fascinating to me because uh, if you talk to an average Venetian, they would either say they're in, you know, they wouldn't really know about the African-American presence there. And I was, but having studied art history and, and, and knowing that there are images of Africans in the, all the major uh, periods um, of art. And uh, I just decided to kind of look at, and certainly in Venice, uh, I brought them to the fore in, in this project. Uh, what you see here is the pavilion and you walk into the center central door and it looks like from this from here as it did in person that these two large black men were holding up the structure of the american pavilion and people thought i was doing something of american slavery but no the, this was a scrim like in, in italy you see scrims everywhere of historic objects as they're fixing the building but i made these strip scrims of these two huge statues there were four of them actually but i used two here of these black men holding up a doge's you know the head of the country in venice uh the do a doge's tomb and so i i made them into scrims and here have them holding up the uh uh holding up the building for the american pavilion and i knew that people would think it was an american story but here you know the the the, the the relationship between Venice and, and America and two and uh, is basically the African population as uh, is the one is the one link historic link, even though this is many centuries before. So next image. And as you came in, uh, this uh, this wooden statue was there, and there, you know, they were with the written. Black child's head is uh, on this on the statue, are in front of many different, uh, or in the lobby of, of different hotels in Venice. And I, I think they what when I had, what this is the first thing you saw when you walked in the pavilion. I think they, they, they someone told me they were draping them because <laughs> they all of a sudden noticed what they were they had there. But here I put the uh, put a globe head on this on this boy, and it's called the Wanderer. The, this is uh, this statue. I've never found any actual statuary polychrome like this, but this this boy servant is in many paintings as well, or type this type of boy servant. Next image. And had, since I was involved with glass very recently, before I I uh, did the, the uh, pavilion, I thought to create a chandelier of black glass, and this was literally the first black Venetian chandelier or first black chandelier ever. And it really, you know, shocked everybody. All the Venetian glass blowers came to see this project. And of course they were thrilled uh, because it's the first time, you know, Venice and the Biennale had ever 
showed anything in Venice, uh, which is and certainly black, it's certainly glass, uh, but it's a, a Rosanico style chandelier uh, in black. And the, it's, uh, the exhibition itself is called Speak of Me As I Am. And uh, as this is titled similarly, uh, and that is a line from, from Othello, the greatest black Venetian that never lived. Uh, and so I, I felt I had deeply, also deeply involved with Othello. I'm very interested in, in, in that, in Shakespeare's play. Um, I wanted to, wanted to have this as the first thing you see. It's, it's, to me, it really embodies, and certainly as the first black chandelier, it certainly embodied uh, um, everything about Othello. Um, when I tried to, when I told the Venetian of Glassblower that I wanted to do this huge chandelier. He's, he said, I can do it any size you want, whatever you want, whatever you want. I said, yes, I want it to be really huge. Okay, no problem. I want it to be black. Black? Oh, artists, anyway. So he, he said, oh, I made something for Yoko Ono, I can do anything. So he made this very large black chandelier and all the Glassblowers came to see it. Um, but it is, to me, it represented Othello. Uh, as he, as he was, you know, as his history in that, as his story in, in, in Shakespeare as a fellow, he was magnificent, mournful, and monstrous uh, all at once. And, you know, for me, I th thought there was a perfect evocation of, of a fellow himself. I paint the interiors, not like, not like a white uh, uh, cube gallery, but I painted the colors of Venice within, within this space. Next. Oh, these, I, we can go through this quickly. These are close-ups of, uh, of Chandelier at, after he came to the United States. Next. You know, Chandeliers are, were made of this style in white and pastel colors because it was to reflect light, to, to make spaces in, you know, the 18th century spaces, brighter. So it would never be done like this because it re reveals the spindly character of, of the object and not reflecting light. Next image. So I got really involved with, with, with glass at, in Murano. I enjoyed working with, with the glass blowers. It, you know, there used to be something like 800 glass fa factories in, in, in Murano in the middle of the, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, middle early part of the 20th century, but uh, it is dwindled down to a very few at this point. It's it's not really uh, respected in the way I think it should be. Their their glass making skills uh, in Italy, uh, and they rely on tourist trade for these kind of things. But I really enjoy them because they they represent so much uh, people's desire. For, for beauty and luxury and, and, uh, and then I sort of twist that with my thoughts. Uh, and certainly once I got hooked on Othello, as this an evocation of Othello, all the titles for these, uh, these chandeliers relate to Othello. This title is To Die Upon a Kiss. It's, this, it's the moment when Othello, uh, he has he has killed Desdemona. Realizes that he is um, uh, he was tricked and and kills himself. So here, you know the, the the terrible death scene in Othello. And so for me, the the the, the life force, the blackness of the body is is heavy and leaks out to leaks out of the body as and perhaps the soul is going up. Someone else thought of that. And I, I, I hardly, uh, I really like that thought. It's, uh, and it goes from uh, clear glass to um, grayish glass to black glass to make it feel like, for me, it feels like the weight of the black is sort of coming, the life force is coming out of the body. And I've made many, many of these related to, uh, not so much about Othello, but related to it and using the great language of, of uh, Shakespeare to title them. Next image. Oh, again, <laughs> uh, next slide. 
Next slide. Um, and also they make really wonderful uh, mirrors in, in Venice and uh, in Murano. And I got engaged with, with the, the mirror makers. Uh, and here, they're basically a stack of mirrors, one on top of the, uh, each other, all with black glass. And this is quite large. Unfortunately, I don't remember the scale of it, but your face would probably be in, in that, the center one. And you can actually see yourself, but you, everyone who looks in there is black. Uh, and uh, it's called Iago's Mirror because I felt this really embodied Iago who would look at Othello uh, and just was so jealous and enraged that he, you know, the layers of, of, uh, of, his, of his anger and his and jealousy just grew and grew. And um, so he sort of embodied, and then he, he embodied, he made Othello embody his own, his, his own evilness. Uh, so it's called Iago's Mirror. Next slide. Oh, close up. You see how detailed it is? Uh, you know, whenever I, I work with these folks, they're very excited because I, I'm working with their own idiom but doing something they would never even think of. And so they really enjoyed that. We, we have a great time, uh, uh, they trying to create what I come up with. Uh, next image. Here's another one. This is called, oh Lord, what, what did I call this one? Um, oh, I, it'll come to me, but it's too late now. It's another, another layering of, um, of glass. Um, I saw his visage in my mind. It's a line uh, that Desdemona speaks about Othello. That's the title. Next image. And here again is a, a, a black glass uh, with, uh, this wasn't in the Biennale, but after that I was making more of these glass forms uh, rising out of the uh, you know, out of the ground or a spill, and uh, it's called um, Dark Dawn. Next slide. This is called The Ominous Glut. Next slide. Uh, and the, the, the last project I'm gonna show you I, I, uh, is one that is the most recent, and now it's getting to be a long time ago, <laughs> 2017. Uh, but um, I was invited by uh, the Istanbul Biennial to do a project in Istanbul. Uh, and this was really exciting for me because many of the paintings that I saw in Venice, where you see an African, you also saw Turks. And so this, this, this early history, these two groups were definitely outsider insider uh, communities in Venice, although everyone went to Venice, and you know, you know, it's very famous for for its its collision of culture, and of course, the the first Jewish ghetto in the world was in Venice, and uh, most other groups have some kind of written history about their being there, but not the Africans. Um, but the the relationship with the Turks over the over the year years, as the centuries. You know, sometimes I would look at the paintings and sometimes they would be trading and sometimes they would be warring and, you know, it's kind of hard to to kind of kind of understand the breadth of history, how all this could be happening. But it was very fascinating to me. So I, I when I got to uh, to Istanbul to make my project, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. or I thought I did uh, and sort of understand the relation between the Turks and the Venetians in the early centuries. And so one of the first well. The next thing I found out, which I had no idea about, was that there were Africans in, in, in Turkey. And uh, I would see African people walking around Istanbul, and I assumed, like I should say, a lot of Turks assumed that they were immigrants from Africa. But in fact, the Turks, they were Blacks in, in, in Turkey for centuries. And um, they, they're mostly coalesced in one, of, one town now, but the history, their history there has never been told and they don't really know much about their history at all. 
they were brought to to uh, um, to to Constantinople uh, by you know stolen off the shores of Africa by Arab traders and sold to the sultans, and um, and they they like many other groups made a home in 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 uh, Istanbul in yeah Istanbul as well as around the, the country. So this was really exciting for me because I got to meet several uh, Afro Turks. You know the, the thing is Afro Turks. There's Afro Turks, Afro Greeks, Afro Kurds, and Afro Armenians. So they were mixed in with this this very fraught and very uh, kind of uh, mixed history uh, uh, in of uh, Turkey. Uh, anyway, this the first thing, of course, I thought to do was to make a chandelier. A, it's a combination of an Ottoman chandelier and a Venetian chandelier in black glass, uh, sort of the evocation of an Afro-Turk. This piece is called, uh-oh, again, I'm sort of blanking on the title. Uh, gosh, darn, I like this title a lot. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a quote. It's a quote from uh, from uh, uh, Pushkin, who uh, a fabulous writer in Russia, but he he uh, understood that his his great grandparents were taken to to Ista, to uh, Constantinople, Constantinople from Africa, and then were brought to uh, by emissaries to Saint, to Peter the Great as a gift. Uh, so, at any rate. Uh, so he he never got to uh, Constantinople himself, but he really saw, understood his heritage, African heritage, through this journey uh, to to Russia. So um, maybe I'll think of this title eventually, but it's not coming to me now. Oh, next slide. Oh, there's a close up. Um, next image. Next image. And I did a, a couple of them. Um, and there are many different aspects of this sort of, you know, thinking about their lives in Turkey and, and also just, um, you know, imagining. And, and they were in many of the paintings as well. In fact, I went, to, this is an Orientalist Museum in Turkey, and I went to, with the collections manager uh, looking in, in his. Uh, Looking in his uh, collection, and and he was said that I asked for you know any Africans, and he said, well, I don't know, maybe one or two. And he, I said, okay. And he showed me them. I said, well, can I look around myself? And he said, sure. And of course, I found many, many more. Uh, it's just when you're not looking for something, you don't see it. And this happened to me at the Metropolitan Museum of Art as well. Uh, but so it's not particularly that collection. It's wherever I go, if you're not if you're not looking for it. You really don't see it, and certainly the back, black populations of in, in, within the collections of museums have not been looked for for, for a very long time. Um, and I could explain to you all these other things, but let's continue to. Oh, this other one is called Eclipse, another another combination chandelier. Next image. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a traditional Turkish tile wall except that the the uh, the flowering is is tr traditional uh and um but the and the colors are traditional colors except that i switched the colors around you had the light color in the background and the dark color you know outlining things um and they told me that i that i couldn't do it because nothing would you wouldn't be able to see anything it's just that they had never done it before in whatever how many hundreds of years they've been making tiles and it's like hey, just do it anyway you know and I, I just want to see what it looks like um, and you know Turks don't uh, can't understand Arabic they don't read it they can't understand it and this but of course this is uh, Arabic is in the mosques and so to me it was not which the you know uh, it's not something they could directly read either I just want it to be a memory it's sort of a memory uh, and, and and related to the to the Afro-Turks, uh, and this, uh, but 
in Arabic, this says, black is beautiful. Next image. And um, I'm not, I didn't show much more of the project because I don't know what, how, what we're doing. But anyway, uh, time-wise, but I, I uh, found many images at, that had the Afro-Turks in them. And obviously, many of them were eunuchs uh, in the Sultan's court. Well, maybe not obviously, but that's, that was the case. And it wasn't only black eunuchs. It was other uh, races as, as well, Europeans. But, uh, but some, one other thing that kind of coalesced for me was that uh, James Baldwin would go to Istanbul to, uh, to write. And sort of he was deeply invested, involved in the civil rights movement in the United States. And he would go to Istanbul to get, totally be able to get away from that. He had friends there uh, and, and uh, write. And he wrote many passages, you know, part of uh, the book, Another Country in Istanbul. And uh, I can understand why. It's, a, it's an amazing place. Uh, so around the room, I had lines from Othello and lines from uh, another country and lines from Pushkin going with all these various paintings that, you know, didn't particularly have titles. And here, this painting, the title I put with it was Next slide. Love is a country he knew nothing about. And that's a line from uh, Baldwin's Another Country. And the la next image. The last image, I, I, uh, there was lots of other things in that show, by the way, but I reduced it just to the, the, bare, the bare minimum. Anyway, this is a sculpture I made in the States. Uh, it is uh, made, uh, it's, a, it's a regular, uh, you know, plastic glo globe, wall globe, or foot, uh, you know, like table size globe. Uh, and it's, uh, I festooned it with, with uh, black um, chandelier parts, but it's an actual, um, I did a great deal of research on this, on where these things are located. It is the Atlantic slave trade it is the uh, Indian Ocean slave trade and, and beyond. And it is the, uh, you know, it's a mapping of that and also a mapping of the uh, consumers and producers of oil. And the title of this sculpture is called The Unnatural Movement of Blackness. And this is the last image I have for you. Fred, thank you so much for that incredible walk, run really through, <laughs> <laughs> through your career. Um, we are going to unlock our chat um, so that you can ask some of your pressing questions and we have Fred for the next 10 minutes. Oh, awesome. um, so as you drop your questions into the chat box, um, I'm going to start with one. Of all of these projects you've shared with us, do any of them feel unfinished to you, undone in some way um, that you'd like to go back and, and add or complete? No, I, I leave a project pretty happy with where it is. You know, I, I try, well, sometimes I have short, I've done projects in much shorter time. You know, I was, I went, I went every month to Istanbul for a year. And I never expected to do that, but I got so in, involved and invested with the Afro-Turks and, and uh, the whole history that I didn't know about the relationship. It was just perfect for me. But, um, uh, but generally speaking, you know, I sort of do what I want. I do, I find out things and create the work and then I'm, I'm on to the next interesting project from, you know, that I work on. There are ones that I've, I haven't, you know, had a lot of time like working at the, uh, Oh, the Liverpool, in Liverpool was a short project, of, um, uh, but about boats uh, and the genderizing of boats, but, uh, or the British Museum also, I didn't get to go as many often as I liked it, but, it, but I, I was very happy with it. Uh, the way the moon's in love with the dark. Thank you very much. <laughs>
that's the title of that of the uh, the Istanbul chandelier um by by uh, Pushkin so yeah so that's so I'm pretty happy with with when I leave the project uh, uh, so and I'm ready to raring to go to go to the to go to the next one to see what I what I find I like going back to the locations and the places because uh, um, I have friends everywhere but uh, you know, pretty satisfied with the end product and sometimes sad that I had to say goodbye, although the Istanbul project went to London and then also to New York. So I felt pretty, pretty satisfied with that. Oh, and also to Los Angeles. So yes, so it was a good run for that. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat and I'll, I'll just jump in and, and uh, ask one of them. Um, which artist today do you resonate with? Oh my goodness. Oh, uh, uh, you know, so many, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a hard one. Uh, um, hmm. Gosh, who do I resonate with at this moment? Oh, you're killing me. I, uh, I'm trying to think, <laughs> I'm trying to think, you know, I, I, I have to say, if I'm so in my, my own world, I, I love what other people do, but I, I, uh, it's sort of not, you know, I have lots of friends and I, and I follow everybody's works and, um, but, uh, yeah. And I, and I don't get to see as much because I'm, you know, on the road and of course the last few years, nobody's seeing much, but, um, yeah, I, I'm going to kick myself, uh, when I afterwards, cause I say, Oh, I could have said so-and-so and so-and-so, and so. but I, I suppose I should, uh, be very nepotistic and, and because I really believe in this, uh, exhibition at, at D.C. Moore Gallery in Manhattan by uh, Whitfield Lovell. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing and happens to me and my spouse, but I, I just know that this is a very special exhibition and I hope folks get to see it. So I'll leave it at that. We're getting some questions about the specifics of those Venice chandeliers, um, the d kind of overall dimensions of them and the weight of them and yeah. who you partnered with to make those. Okay. Um, the overall dimensions, I, I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't, I can't, you know, I don't, um, I'm trying to think what I could relate that to the size of it. Um, Is it taller than you? Uh, I think the big one is would be around my height, maybe. Yes, something like wow. that. And uh, um, there are many different museums in the states. If you're in Cleveland or if you're upstate New York, at uh, um, at the oh gosh, all right. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm not a booster for even, for even my own work. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, it's now. What was part, the other part of that question? I could answer. What was the, what was the other part of that question? Um, so just generally, how big they are, how heavy they oh, are. Oh yes, the, ballpark. Well, they're heavy, but the the heaviest was the one in Istanbul, which was six hundred pounds. So. Um, wow. Um, and the glassmakers that you worked with, who were they? How did you find oh, I, them? I still work with them. Well, what happened, I, you know, when I was representing the, the, the Biennale, uh, American Pavilion, everybody, you know, trying try to make whatever I wanted to happen, happen. And so I, I, the first one was with one person and then I, I went back and the glass uh, mirrors was with an, uh, someone who came to me and uh, who's a sort of entrepreneurial um, uh, uh, glass man and he, he you know, made the large, the, the large mirror projects happen. And, uh, and uh, so I, so from there, I worked with someone named Stefano Tosso in, in Istanbul, excuse me, I'm getting confused, in Venice, in Murano. And he, he and I really work very closely together. Uh, he, I throw things at him that get more and more complicated and he, he's great with it. I mean, it was fantastic in Istanbul, you know, he, uh, he was able to figure out how to put these two chandeliers together, which were totally different. 
the big, you know, the, the Venetian one is what it is, and the Istanbul is sort of a big, they're all canisters that hang down from a metal plate. And, uh, you know, he was able to figure that out perfectly. In fact, when he came over to install it, he brought his, his person with him, who was Venetian, only really spoke Venetian, uh, and I guess Italian too, but mostly Venetian. And he spoke a Venetian, Italian, and um, French. And in Istanbul, they, they, uh, no one spoke any of those languages except for French. And so the electrician spoke French, so he could talk to, to, uh, to, to my guy. And then, of course, the staff at the museum didn't speak French. Uh, and so it got, it got very common. It was a sort of a combination of people talking to each other through, through the language they could speak to, to get this thing up in the sky. It was, it, I, I, I wish you could have been there. It's, it was hysterical. So, what, you know, so all of a sudden the light went on and everybody, you know, said, hurrah, you know, because it was this big project to get it up. We have a question also in the chat um, about the ways that uh, you use the color black in your work. And if you could speak a little bit more about the, maybe on like a metaphorical level of yeah. the significance of that. Yeah, uh, I really I really started with black in, in, in uh, um, Pilchuk in the glass school because you can make anything out of any color in, uh, in glass. And I wanted to, bring it down to just what, uh, you know, you know, just to reduce that because anything you make in glass is going to look good. And I want to reduce it to one color and try to squeeze the meaning out of that, uh, out of it. And I chose black because, you know, I'm African American. Uh, but also it as with, uh, but it has also many other meanings and many, and different meanings to many people. Certainly mourning is, is another, uh, another aspect of the color black. Uh, and um, so, you know, I try to infuse whatever I'm doing, try to infuse, infuse that into the project so that there has many kind of associations for different people. And, uh, um, but then for me, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, the sort of notion of blackness, you know, African American as, as it has been formulated in African American with African Americans and then now the global African. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a constant for me in that in the in the ways that from that direction, I, I think about it. Uh, but it works well in, in a lot of different contexts as well. Um. I think we've reached really the end of our evening together. Fred, we are so grateful to you and to everybody who showed up to learn, to listen, um, to see, really see this evening. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your curiosity and really just thank you for your, the generosity of your time tonight, Fred. We're really appreciative. Thank you. I really enjoyed it and wish I could have seen you all, <laughs> but that's the way of the future, I guess. Next time. <laughs> next time. Next time. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a great evening. And if you enjoyed this program, it will be up on our YouTube channel soon. Please share it widely with friends, family, loved ones. Thank you. Thank you.